So today uh, uh, we're going to talk about some uh, uh, findings that have to do with the injuries you get with instability. And one of the areas, the area around the, uh, the Hill Sachs injury, and you can get impaction injuries to the bone in this location for three common reasons, uh, at least common if you do a lot of baseball players. Uh, one is that this is the area where you get the Hill Sachs fracture that we've been talking about, and that posterior superior aspect of the humeral head. This is really the same location where you also get erosion from chronic traction changes at the infraspinatus insertion. And almost everybody will have these traction changes at the infraspinatus insertion. Uh, so we have to figure out how to differentiate the Hill Sachs injury from uh, the uh, uh, insertional uh, cysts. And then this is also the same area where you get impaction injury to the humeral head uh, and overhead throwers who get posterior impingement. <clears throat> so this one you can usually differentiate based upon the history, if you get a history, uh, and that you're dealing with overhead athletes. And the prone of the principal concerns is always going to be posterior impingement. So the history is very, very helpful here. Hill Sachs, obviously, you get a history of dislocations uh, is very helpful in, in this one. Uh, but sometimes you, you don't get the history. So there are some imaging findings that we look for. So here's a, here's a situation on 32003, and this is a typical Hill Sachs. Notice that it's kind of a V-shaped depression. Uh, there's a little bit of edema adjacent to it in this case. If you follow it up uh, a few months later, you can see the edema goes away, and you're left with this very characteristic V-shaped indentation that has a relatively smooth margin. If you have traction cystic changes from the infraspinatus insertion, you'll have more cysts rather than this smooth, smooth V-shaped impaction injury. You're going to have irregularity in cystic changes. And since so many people have traction injuries in this location, you could have a hill sacks on top of that and get a little bit of both. So again, the history. The other thing you look for then is if you have a tear of the anterior inferior labrum, which could go along with the anterior dislocation, or a bony band cart injury uh, as well. So uh, let's see, Robert, what do you think is going on here? Okay, so I guess looking at that posterior lateral uh, humeral head, it looks like there's some cystic change. Uh, yeah, right there. I guess it could be either traction cyst from that infraspinatus or bank art lesion. I'd want to look at the, the labrum. Okay, there's what the labrum looks like. That looks normal. Okay. Uh, but if that this is and this is basically anterior near the equator. Okay. If we go more inferiorly, this is what it looks like. Well, it looks like it's truncated and missing that anterior labrum. Yeah, more. it's very blunted there. And we're kind of missing that anterior labrum. If you go more inferiorly, you can actually see that there's a regularity here consistent with a torn, probably displaced uh, labral tear. And this is someone who had chronic instability uh, uh, by history. Uh, so this is really a chronic Hill Sachs. This is probably the Hill Sachs. That's probably a traction injury from the infraspinatus, a little bit slightly different location than normal. And we can see more of an inferior tear of the uh, labrum. And this is a patient who had a uh, well-documented history of chronic repetitive anterior dislocations. Okay, Taysom. All right, MLB shortstop with shoulder pain. So I do see a focal concavity at the uh, posterior lateral humeral head. Um, I guess the is the labrum a little bit frayed uh, posteriorly? Is this a little bit dark? Very high here, so that's. Oh, I mean, uh, posteriorly. Oh, is posterior it? back here. Yeah. I don't think enough to be abnormal. Okay. And you notice here, this, this looks like kind of cystic changes rather than that smooth V-shape. Yeah. In that area. And then if we look up here, uh, we can see that that's that kind of irregularity. Uh, without really a, a defined depression, 
Now, if we get more anteriorly, inferiorly, the the labrum looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And this was just an all an, uh, an erosion from chronic traction injury from the infraspinatus. Okay. Okay, in that in that region of the posterior humeral head, we see some intraosseous cysts. I don't. Yeah, it looks like could be traction changes. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's really traction changes and a a little bit prominent cyst, a little bit more prominent than we normally see. But you know, this doesn't have any of the morphological characteristics of a hill sacs, right? Here, let me just do this one. So here's an A review. In this particular case, what we see is what looks like a V-shaped impaction injury here. So we'd be worried about a uh, hill sacs. But notice here we also have some fraying and irregularity of the uh, rotator cuff insertion back in this location. In this case, a loose body. I think you've seen this this uh, uh, slide before, uh, and this is. Uh, uh, a major league baseball pitcher, and this is what uh, internal impingement looks like. Uh, so again, th this looks very much like that V-shape impaction injury, and if you think about it, uh, posterior impingement is just repetitive impaction injuries. So it's not uh, this, surprising that it doesn't look uh, a lot like hill sacks. This is not reduced, uh, is it? Uh, he's in the Abe review here. Uh, it's actually... Uh, uh, you know, th this just shows uh, here where the glenoid will impact the uh, humeral head to produce this uh, injury of uh, internal impingement or posterior impingement. Okay. Go ahead, John. Yeah, usually you don't see it, um, uh, Hill Sachs in, in, in this kind of a position after the shoulders reduced. I, I, I understand this in the yeah. paper view, but the, the, this patient did not have instability, John. Yeah, well, I, he must be used to it because this is uh, this is actually uh, where you would find the glenoid uh, locked with uh, with the hill sacs. Right. So, so the and, and, talking about three and, things and, and, that all occur at the hill sacs location, and that this is this one. This is the third example of what can produce what looks like a hill sacs in this location, which is posterior impingement from repetitive yeah. overhead throwing, the cocking phase. Okay. So let's go on now and talk about uh, posterior labral tears. Uh, these can be due to a posterior dislocation of the shoulder. Uh, tear, uh, you can have what's called a popsal lesion, posterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion that we'll talk about. In the same location, you get a Bennett lesion, and then we'll talk about a Kim lesion uh, as well in this location. Okay. The bond. Oh, what should be the highbrow person here today? So this patient fell while saving a Picasso from dropping in Malaysia. Hmm. I get. Um, so here, this is an AP view, and normally you should have a little clear zone here. If you look carefully, there's a little trough here in the humeral head, and it looks like that posterior glenoid may be fit into the trough. Okay. So normally in this position, you should see a clear space in through here. So if you don't see it, you should be concerned okay. about this lesion. Now, if we go to, this is basically the Y view, what do you see here? I think there's a, a little bit of posterior Right. Dislocation. The humeral head is back here. It's not centered over the yeah. dislocation. So these are the x-ray findings that you see in posterior dislocation. But but they can be so uh, if you're not thinking about it. Uh, but here's what the MR looks like. Oh, wow. Uh, 
So what do you see here? Uh, so posterior dislocation, and then we see an indentation of the, I guess the anterior humeral, like anteromedial humeral head, right. and then the posterior um, acetabulum is kind of notched into that area, and there's that's the big thing. impact that. Right. right. Yeah. So right. So what we're seeing here. So here's a posterior dislocation, and here we have an anterior hill sacs, or reverse hill sacs, uh, incurring 180 degrees from where we normally see it, which you would expect since we normally see anterior dislocation, and now we're seeing a posterior dislocation. Posteriors are usually pretty straight posterior, anterior usually anterior inferior, so they're not exactly 180 degrees from each other. You can see this is relatively acute with a bone marrow edema here, and this patient's locked in place. And here you can see that there should be a labrum here. The labrum has been sheared off, and the labrum now is sitting over here in this particular patient. So this is kind of a classic injuries that you would see in a posterior dislocation. Uh, on the coronal images, we can see the bony impaction edema uh, here. On the T1, again, we can see the, the posterior dislocation. So that's that's a posterior dislocation, and so you see exactly the mechanism here and what's happening, so you know where to look for the different injuries. Okay, Robert. All right, so it looks like, again, there's kind of irregularity of that, um, I guess, the joint space there. The humerus looks like it's... Uh, I'm suspecting there's another posterior dislocation, basically. Yeah, well, well, clearly the humeral head's not normally positioned with it within the glenoid fossa, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And and here it's not anteriorly dislocated, but again, you don't see that clear space between the two, uh, and so the, and it looks like you've got a, a, a kind of an impaction here on the humeral head, and the humeral head is probably flipped behind the glenoid dislocation. We've got some bone fragments mm -hmm. inferiorly. Right, so I think you're right. It looks like a posterior dislocation. The Y view, again, we've got a posteriorly dislocated humeral head, and we can see the posterior edge of the glenoid fit right into an, an impaction of the reversed hill sacs lesion within the, the humeral head. And this is a, what it looks like by MR, exactly what you guys would expect from seeing the last case. This is just a little bit more of a prominent uh, Injury. Right. And the, the, it's interesting here that the x rays were 1223, the MR is a few weeks later, and they're still engaged. Okay. Taste it normal or abnormal? Uh, definitely abnormal. So. Nine-year-old male, recurrent shoulder dislocation. I think it's currently dislocated posteriorly. And yeah, there's some uh, injury to the posterior glenoid and labrum. And so here's the head posterior position. Here you can see the yeah. head posteriorly position with respect to the glenoid. I don't, I don't really see a, an injury of the... Uh, uh, kind of a reverse bony bank card here, mm -hmm. and, and that typically with these posterior dislocations, you'll get a, a, a tear of the labrum, but I think you get uh, glenoid fractures less commonly than with anterior dislocations, but maybe I just haven't seen enough to see that very often. But this is a classic dislocation. Uh, what do you think about when you see this? Um, you're talking about clinically? Yeah, clinically. Like electrocution or seizure yeah. or something? Right. Yeah. Yeah, elect electrocution and seizures are the, are the really common ones. The other thing that you look for is the morphology of the glenoid. And what do you see in the glenoid morphology here? Uh, I would say the posterior is a little bit more diminutive than the uh, anterior glenoid. Okay. And then if you actually draw the angles here, this is very, this is, uh, what angle would I draw here if I were interested? You're looking for the the version? Right, right. right. Okay. So this has a very retro, retroverted uh, glenoid, which is probably congenital. So in this particular case, this is probably congenital instability because of uh, 
retroversion of the glenoid. Okay. Okay, so again, we see a posterior dislocation. Okay. Um, yeah, we see a reverse hill sacs lesion in the glenoid. Looks okay on this axial view. Terry's minor edema. Um, so this is on 62806. Mm -hmm. You can see the Terry's minor edema down here as well. So this now the patient came back on 7106. So what's the difference here? Uh, well, it's been reduced. It's right. a normal position. And, so, and we normally see it after it's reduced. So normally when they come in the scanner, they're going to be reduced. And so this is what the reverse hill sac should look like typically when you see it mostly in, in practice. Mm -hmm. In this case, you've got edema here. So this is goes along with it being acute. And that's a typical reverse hill sacs. But just uh, kind of look for other injuries you can see to the soft tissues when you have these dislocations. So 22-year-old male athlete, 16 days after injury. Uh, again, we see some edema at the anterior aspect of the humeral head and maybe a little bit of flattening or notching. And then at the uh, posterior aspect of the labrum, we see a tear. Right, so there's the reverse of sex and there's the posterior of the tear. What do we see up here? Hmm. It might be... Uh... So, so often with anterior dislocations, you'll get a tear of the anterior inferior uh, capsule or the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament because when you dislocate uh, anteriorly, that ligament should be there to stop you from doing that. So you often have to tear it or strip it off the periosteal attachment to the glenoid to allow the anterior dislocation. So, so you'll often get thickening and edema within the inferior glenohumeral ligament, something we look for with frozen shoulder, for example, but it's, it's due to the tear, or sometimes it will tear off the humerus, and you'll get a haggle lesion with an anterior dislocation. With the posterior dislocation, I think maybe the posterior capsule is a little bit more compliant, but you can get tears of the middle glenohumeral ligament which uh, is stretched and, and torn. So that's, uh, that's what we have here. Okay, Robert, normal or abnormal? That's uh, grossly abnormal there. Uh, looks like there's a lot of deformity of that humeral head and it says trauma two months ago. So it's a lot of fatty atrophy of the musculature as well. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like fractured in multiple parts there yeah so you have a, need to kind of count the major part and uh but this this is a patient had a posterior dislocation and in older people where they have a lot of osteoporosis uh fractures are, are common in posterior dislocations uh, and they're usually pretty gross and not very subtle all right so i see a small reverse hill sex lesion with some subtle edema and uh, looks like we have a impaction injury at the posterior glenoid with a torn and detached labrum. Right. So just what you'd expect. Right. Good. All right. Okay, so it came in with a history of a posterior dislocation. Mm -hmm. So image on the left. Okay, we're a little further down in the shoulder. I see some edema in the anterior glenoid. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, the image on the oh yeah, some edema there in the in the deltoid muscle. Um, in the coronal view there, that's hmm. Terry's minor. Okay, Terry's minor. Is that a, a demon, Terry's minor? A little bit in the, a bit in the delta. Right? Okay. There's a sagittal nucleus. Sagittal. Okay, so anterior inferior glenoid. I'm seeing. Hmm. Now, two foci of increased signal. I mean, I wonder if there's been a repair. Okay, so here, so did you notice here, this looks like this patient has had a prior bank heart lesion, so they've had a prior anterior dislocation, mm. and they did a bank heart repair, but if you do the measurements here, you would see that this is a very small uh, uh, area of uh, bone loss. What? Bone loss. Well, the, the uh, glenoid tract mm -hmm. is going to be very... If you did a full circle here, you'd find that a pretty high percentage of the anterior posterior part of the glenoid is, is abnormal here. So this was before we had a, a good knowledge of the glenoid tract. And so uh, this patient probably needs a bony procedure, as we talked about in the last couple of lectures. Uh, but they got a band cart in. Uh, <clears throat> and if we go back here, uh, this patient probably has... Uh, multi-directional instability, probably had an anterior dislocation, but by history they also had a posterior dislocation. So this is a very unstable shoulder. But now we see that there's edema uh, within uh, the posterior deltoid and the teres minor muscles here. And this is a patient who had neuropraxis uh, from the instability, so probably strained the axial nerve. Uh, and and these are the neuropathy associated with that. Okay. And you know this is kind of the reason why it's important now to do those measurements and calculations uh, to look for uh, the percentage involvement as well as uh, whether or not it's an on-track or off-track lesion, so that the proper surgery gets performed. Thanks. Uh, so, I see uh, some abnormality at the posterior aspect of the labrum. So, so this is just a posterior labrum tear. Okay. okay. In this case, you know, you have to look around and make sure this isn't a reverse cell sax, but it wasn't. This was just a, a labral tear. John, are you with us? Whoa. Look here. John, we lost you. John, are you with us? I've been trying to get back. Oh my gosh, I just noticed that you... Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I just noticed Good. that you weren't there. I just got back. I had a hell of a time getting back. Uh, well, that's, I hadn't realized you were gone. and I, For some reason, it made me have to... It's, it's, it's only Monday, John. That's right, it's only money. And here's another posterior label tear, as you would kind of expect that they would look like. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this one? Uh, here, I think there's also a tear of that posterior labrum. Right. So here, you can also see that the capsule, when you come up here, is also torn in this particular case. So there's a posterior superior label tear, but there's also a capsular tear. And this patient. Okay. All right, recurrent dislocation, multidirectional instability. So we're looking at a posterior labral tear. Okay, so here we see a posterior signal, a posterior labral tear here. It looks like it's not displaced much. We can see it in all three planes. And this is called a polyp. Pulsed popsal lesion, uh, which is a posterior labral capsular periosteal sleeve avulsion, uh, a lot like the anterior one we saw before. These are less common, but it's basically another tear with the periosteal attachment uh, intact. Uh, 
again, I, I don't I don't use this term. I, you know, I talk about the periost attachments. If it's intact, it really doesn't change the management. It's whether the periost attachment is there or not. It's treated the same. You go in and do a Bancroft type repair, or you do suture anchor repair of the of the labral tear. So if you look in uh, David's book, uh, which I think this comes from Dr. Sue, but I think these look like they're images from uh, uh, out of David's book. You've got a bank cart tear. This is more anterior now, classic, where you have a displaced tear of the labrum with a tear of the periosteal attachment, an alpsal lesion where you have a tear of the labrum which is displaced and then adheses back to the bone anteriorly here, a prothes lesion which is a tear with the periosteal attachment intact, and then you have the reverse bank cart back here, and the popsal lesion is basically a perthes lesion uh, posteriorly here. So I'll say this because <laughs> you may work with people who like these kind of names and so forth, but it's worth looking for these. The important one, obviously, is to look for a tear. The other thing is the alpsal lesion is important because sometimes these can be a little bit subtle and the surgeon really wants to know about it because if they go in there to operate, they have to free this up, as I talked about before, put it in proper place, and then suture it back down. So they'd like to know about it. Okay. Okay, so here, the posterior labrum, we have a thickened periosteum, we have a posterior labral tear. It looks like it's displaced medially a little bit. Um, so this is a popsal lesion. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. No, we're talking about posterior labral right here. So what do you see on the x ray? Um, this is something you need to know about because you can see these on x ray and the surgeons all know about it. Okay. So oh, it's like a bunoy looks like, like it's beveled. Yeah, I see a lucency there. Um, right it's there. Around it as well. So, I think it might be the uh, like That's the periosteal reaction associate or the thickening associated with the uh, like that sleeve avulsion. Part of the glenoid labrum. So, so this is a, a paper about this. Uh, this is, if you see on the MR examination, it looks like this. And so here you can see that there probably is a little separation on the base of the posterior labrum. There's a lot of thickening of this periosteal attachment. And it's kind of inhomogeneous in signal, and, and that's in large part because you've got a lot of calcium in, in this, but it's not as dense a calcium as you've seen before. And this is called a Bennett lesion. And Bennett lesions are basically chronic posterior labral tears, which calcify. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has a name because you could see it on plane films. And there are a lot of these kind of injuries, obviously, you can't see on a plane film on an MR. Uh, and they can be associated with uh, blunting or uh, a retroversion of the glenoid because that makes people at increased risk for a posterior dislocation. An injury to that posterior labrum. So this is called a Bennett lesion, and uh, it's basically a chronic posterior labral tear. And this is another case where there is a Bennett lesion on x-rays, and you can see the displaced uh, kind of macerated tear of the posterior labrum. You can again see that, as John said, beveling of that posterior glenoid, or you probably have a congenital uh, anomaly of the posterior glenoid. There's probably a large posterior labrum here before, which has now become degenerated and torn. And uh, here we can see this has a periosteal attachment, which I don't have the x-rays, but the surgeon told me that uh, there was a Bennett lesion on x-rays, so it was calcified on x-rays. So another Bennett lesion. Robert. All right, so let's see. We have a 27-year-old with right shoulder pain for three years, and he's a baseball player. Uh, the posterior labrum looks thick, and I think there may be a tear, but I 
Yeah, and yeah. through here. Yeah. Now, remember, one of the main reasons why these the posterior labrum is at risk in athletes, you don't see it very often at all in non-athletes uh, because the congenital anomalies which can lead to this are really pretty rare. Uh, you see it often in athletes because it's basically an injury to the shoulder from bench pressing or weightlifting mm -hmm. because people aren't taught properly how to bench press and you can get a little bit more power in your bench press if you basically bounce the humeral head off that posterior labrum uh, when you bring your arms back and then you go forward from that bounce uh, to press the barbell up. And when you bounce the glenoid here against that posterior labrum, uh, that can injure the labrum over time and produce these posterior labral tears. <clears throat> so they're typically in athletes who, who do a lot of bench pressing, and that would be... Uh, the pitchers in baseball, because as we've talked about before, uh, the speed of the fastball is, is directly proportional to the strength of the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi muscles. So they like to build up the pec major muscles to improve their fastball speed. And then in general, uh, in weightlifters, football players who do a lot of weightlifting and so forth. So and they should always have somebody uh, holding on to the bar uh, of the weights so that it doesn't come down uh, on their neck and also produce this kind of a problem yeah. on the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Somebody should always be there um, okay. holding on to the bar to prevent an accident. Yeah. And and here's that calcification you can see back here on the Bennett lesion. Here's the CT where you can see the calcification right along that periosteal attachment to the posterior labrum. Basically, it's like a reverse bank card. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who did the last one? Or I forget. It's me now. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think there is a defect of the posterior labrum and uh, the uh, posterior glenoid also looks irregular. And then here are the sagittal images. You can see that posterior label tear, and you're right. Well, there's some blunting here of the glenoid, and you can see flattening of that posterior glenoid, so they have a little bit of basically a reverse bony band card injury in this particular patient. And this is what it looks like on the CT, just like you would expect. So, this is just a little quarter fraction that goes through the articular cartilage, and this little bit of the glenoid displaced posteriorly here. Okay. So this isn't, and by on x-rays, this would be called a Bennett lesion, but it's actually a different uh, etiology than the uh, calcified chronic label tear that we talked about before. This is actually a true fracture of the posterior glenoid rim. Okay. And again, this is typically occurs in weightlifters, and you can see the patient's muscles are well-developed. Okay, 20 year old roulette labral tear. Um, in these coronal views, I'm looking at the inferior labrum. It looks splunted. Uh, uh, glenoid looks kind of beveled, as John said. Mm -hmm. as well. And then, what else do you see here? Um, yeah, looking at the posterior labrum, there's just this, this thickened tissue there. Scar uh, tissue. Mm. So, but, but if you let the actual surface of the labrum look smooth here, so you don't really see a direct tear. This is called a Kim lesion after the surgeon who described it. And this is uh, 
Uh, th this is actually at, arth at arthroscopy. If they go in, this is a soft lesion, whereas the labrum sh should be nice and firm, so it uh, it, it uh, holds the uh, uh, you know the humeral head in place. Uh, this is injury to the deep parts, the subsurface part of the posterior labrum, often associated with underlying bony deformity, as we see here. So that when you go in, the posterior inferior labrum is just very soft and therefore is it no longer is useful in stabilizing the shoulder. But the surface is still intact. Uh, so it's, it, it's hard to see. And here we can also see there's a big periosteal reaction associated with this. Uh, this. This is just described in the posterior inferior part of the glenoid. And it's treated like, like a typical labral tear. They, they basically go in and uh, put in suture anchors and tighten the labrum in the posterior inferior area uh, in these kind of lesions. But it's not widely known or recognized, but this is what a chem lesion looks like. So, and here's the, the paper from Dr. Kim in arthroscopy in 2004. And uh, if you don't address it properly, you end up with persistent posterior instability. And some of these may be acquired. Some may be congenital, uh, like that one may be. Uh, some may be acquired where you get traumatic injury to the underlying bone, whereas the surface of the labor may stay intact. And then you can get depression of the bone, so the bone no longer is supportive of the overlying cartilage, so the cartilage will depress down where it shouldn't be able to, and the humeral head will just glide over it. So this is another chem lesion uh, uh, here. So this this um, glenoid doesn't have the depth, the depth like it's supposed to. Right. Isn't that right, John? That's right, yeah. So that's a chem lesion. I would, I would, I would, it would be interesting to try to Look the four quarter on this patient. It, it, it I wouldn't be able to demonstrate that to the to the audience. Okay. It probably doesn't. Uh, wouldn't hold the head like like uh, you usually do. Okay. You know how they show that the you can lift the whole four quarter of the body with the. Yeah. With releasing all the ligaments. Yeah, you lose the suction seal, right? Yeah, with the suction. Yeah. But uh, this doesn't give you much suction. Right. Um, so this is a 24-year-old male um, with a suspected a labral tear. So there's that. There's some edema around the posterior labrum, and it looks a little bit irregular as well. It's probably the underlying tear. Um, let's see. So I see here. Definitely see a tear there um, yeah. with some like under undermining, like with some fluid there. Yeah. So this is a uh, uh, posterior labral tear. And at the time that they looked at the study, they, they were concerned about a possible chem lesion. But I think this one actually extended to the surface. So. I mean, this wasn't described that long ago. Right, 2004. Yeah. Yeah. And it's thought... You know, I think it can be congenital if you have a underdevelopment of that posterior inferior glenoid, but I think most of them are thought to be acquired lesions due to repetitive trauma. And, and my guess, from the ones I've seen, I think a lot of them do have blunting here. Uh, it may be due to just injury to the inferior to the inside of the labrum and the superficial structure stay intact, or sometimes it may be due to a subchondral fracture, which you can get with impaction because the bone is rigid but the cartilage is not, and the labrum and cartilage can stay intact. And then you end up with 
impaction of the bone, kind of a depression of the bone, which no longer adequately supports the overlying soft tissues, and it becomes soft. And it just shows how with the probe, you can actually show that it's too soft back there to actually hold the head and hold the suction seal that John was talking about. That's as opposed to the popsal lesion, uh, which we've already talked about here. Okay. All righty. Uh, Robert. All right, so we have a 42-year-old with bilateral shoulder pain one week after bungee jumping. Let's see. I see some edema kind of overlying the the humerus, and then the inferior capsule looks kind of edematous, and I don't see a clean stripe there. Yeah. Okay. So anything's going on here? Uh, I'd be worried about, I guess, injury to the inferior glenohumeral ligament and capsule. Right, right. So it looks like a Hegel deformity. It looks like that inferior capsule or the inferior glenohumeral ligaments have torn off the, the humerus here. Uh, but it really looks like this patient might have had more of a, inf uh, of a dislocation because it looks like there's more than just that uh, inferior glenohumeral ligaments torn here. In fact, we can see that there is a fr uh, comminuted fracture of the greater tuberosity as well. Uh, in this particular patient, and uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, you usually fix these open with a small incision. Mm -hmm. And then the common bungee injuries. If you think about it, you can get ocular injuries because of the the uh, pressure on the bulb when you s slow down. Back injuries. Uh, perineal palsies you can get from uh, uh, injury to the nerves, anacranial hemorrhage, death has been described, uh, but the shoulder injuries are not well reported, but they can occur. So anybody for bungee jump, jumping this weekend? <laughs> okay, uh, who's next? I think it's me. All right, 20-year-old MLP pitcher, new clicking history of label repair. So I think we do see some susceptibility artifact in the glenoid from the prior repair. Um, looks like there's a kind of a diminutive looking post here, glenoid with a kind of a larger post here labrum, but there's a definitely a defect right there. Right. Yeah. Good. So that's what we have. If you do the ABRA view, that posterior area is back here. And you can see where the, the surgery was before, but it looks like there's a tear there, the base of that labrum. Here we can see that this patient also has what looks like a Hill Sachs lesion, so they may have multidirectional instability. And, and at surgery, this was a re tear, and this was uh, the patient had a retroversion of the glenoid, large posterior labrum, this was a congenital anomaly and had actually multidirectional instability and retore the, the labor. So uh, glenoid dysplasia, a more uh, obvious case of glenoid dysplasia is this one, where you can see severe retroversion of the, of the glenoid, uh, prominent posterior labrum, and a tear here. But if in these kind of patients, the actual glenoid uh, force is right at the labral bone junction. So you can see why the labrum being a soft tissue structure can't handle those kind of forces, and you will very commonly get tears here at the base of these large labrum. So uh, glenoid dysplasia is a major risk factor for these posterior labral tears. Fortunately, we don't see it that often. Are these congenital, John? Yes. And, and could it be and that these kids uh, have uh, a grand mal seizures from at birth? Yeah, I mean, they, they also may have a grand mal seizure, but the dysplasia, I don't... Yeah, I mean, it, could, could a grand mal seizure yeah. continuous uh, without correction uh, with drugs? Could it produce something like that, I wonder? <laughs> 
I've never seen a case, so I don't. I, I'm, that would be acquired. I'm, whist I'm whistling this Dixie here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here, 26 year old multi directional instability. I see a Hill Sachs defect. I think I see a reverse Hill Sachs defect. I see the posterior labrum looks thickened and torn, likely chronic tear. There's defect of the posterior labrum, or I'm sorry, the glenoid. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is another person who had a congenital uh, dysplasia. And in this case, you know, I had a very uh, abnormal small glenoid. So uh, uh, the, the patient was in, unstable. And this was multidirectional. You can see there's probably a tear of that anterior capsule, tear of the posterior capsule. This patient just was very unstable, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Right? And this is a hill sac in an atypical location because... This is not a typical this dislocation. Because probably will wind up with a fusion. Wow. Uh, let me think. And we can keep going. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk about uh, inferior label tears. You can get these from inferior dislocation, from and you get get Hegel lesions or humeral avulsion of the glenoid. Glenoid, inferior glenohumeral ligament, reverse Hegel, uh, where you get an avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament from the glenoid rather than from the humeral side. Uh, uh, I mean, a reverse Hegel would be one that's uh, a, a regular Hegel, tends to be more anterior, reverse Hegel more posteriorly, and then there's a gaggle lesion, which is a glenoid avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, which comes off the glenoid, and then a GLAD lesion, which is a glenolabral articular disruption that we have already talked about. Uh, okay. Um. So I do see some irregularity there. So inferior uh, labral tear, probably. So here we see an inferior labral tear, right? Yeah. Inferior margin. Yeah. And then if we go to the Abra view, it's it's down here, kind of inferior, and this one goes also a little bit anterior here. And notice also there's a little prominence of that inferior uh, recess. Uh, with uh, the, in this uh, arthrogram. Uh, so this was predominantly an inferior labral tear. Occasionally these can be caused by a straight inferior dislocation. I actually had one of those earlier today. I should have shown you guys uh, here. Okay. Uh, Absolutely gets stretched out. Right. Yeah, with the dislocation, you can stretch out the capsule. Somewhere we'll talk about what's too big here, which I think is 17 millimeters, but, but we'll get to that probably in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? Uh, let's see. On the right, right-sided image, it looks like there's a little cluster of paralabral cysts. Right. And then here you can see there's a defect here. Remember, below the equator, there should not be a recess. So here we're seeing fluid go deep to the labrum. That indicates a labral tear, and it's confirmed really by seeing this paralabral cyst. So this is an inferior labral tear. This one's relatively acute rather than degenerative uh, because there are relatively sharp margins here. And uh, this is what it looks like in the Aber view, anteriorly inferiorly here. Okay. Jason? I, th I think these occur with the arms straight up in the air um, okay. when they fall. Good. All right. So looks like we have a couple paralabral cysts projecting inferiorly from the inferior. So sometimes it's hard to see the tears. 
the paralabral cyst is a pretty reliable indication that you're dealing with uh, uh, an inferior labral tear. And notice that this is down. What are these areas? What are these things down here? I said, is this in your quadrilaterals? That's the axillary dermis and yeah. vessels here in the quadrilateral space. So I think, though I don't have proof of it, that one of the possible causes of having an isolated teres minor muscle atrophy in athletes may be an old inferior labral tear that developed a cyst and then had neurocompromise, which caused atrophy of the muscle. And then the cyst kind of heals with scarring, uh, and the tear heals with scarring, and the cyst goes away. So when you see it, is all you're left with is uh, teres minor atrophy. I'm sure that's not the only cause of it, but uh, uh, otherwise, that's fairly fairly common that we see isolated teres minor yeah. atrophy in athletes. And I can't think of too many other. You could just have straight uh, traction injury to the axillary nerve. Uh, which we might not see on an MR examination, uh, but this is one possible mechanism where we might be able to get that finding. I would certainly put a stretch on it. Yeah. Okay, we have a 78 year old woman, right shoulder pain for four months, electric shock like pain, and then weakness. Um, was it EMG, acute brachial plexitis finding? Physical exam, yeah. Okay, so we see in the top middle image, we see some fluid along the inferior aspect of the joint space, uh, maybe intervening fluid under under the, a torn inferior labrum. Um, okay, there's some edema going posteriorly. That's the... What muscle is that? <laughs> is that the triceps? Well, yes, yeah, probably yes. the inferior glenoid going yeah. down into the triceps. This is probably the long head of the triceps. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mystery here. So right the attachment. That's the okay. long head of the triceps muscle there. Mm -hmm. And so, how's it innervated? Uh, it's radial nerve innervated. So. Yeah, yeah, axillary nerve. Okay. X-ray nerve goes right in through here, and that innervates that triceps, I think. Okay. And then here we we can see there the different heads of the two of the heads of the triceps coming in. The one going to the inferior glenoid is the long head, and the short heads go to the scapula. And this is the quadrilateral space where the axillary vessels and nerves go. So you can see how you could compromise that, that space by these large cysts or joint space. Okay, and then here we have basically a tear, a displaced tear of the labrum going in fairly here. And there you can see the tear going uh, below the equator, uh, deep to the labrum, with some thickening of the periosteal attachment. And then there we can see that displaced flap of labral tear going inferiorly there. Okay. Um, I see some kind of blunting of the inferior labrum as well as some edema around it here yeah. yeah and then some edema like inferior to the uh glenoid and then there's that that kind of irregular and maybe thickened tissue uh, okay. in that of the capsule up here so we have some edema there and maybe a little so why don't you give me the history i think uh it's probably an inferior dislocation. Good. So this is an inferior dislocation. Here we have a superior, straight superior hill sacs, abnormal location because this is a very uncommon kind of injury. Go straight inferiorly, and we have a tear of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Maybe kind of a diffuse tear, but also probably off the humerus. 
so a type of Hegel, and we have extravasation of fluid into the surrounding soft tissues. And here we can see a little bit of a tear anteriorly as well, but all that soft tissues is fluid. And so this is a Hegel lesion uh, from an inferior dislocation. Uh, let's see. And here's another example. In this case, uh, uh, this is more of a mid-substance tear of the inferior glenohumeral ligament with a lot of thickening, but a complete tear here. The humeral attachment is still attached. The glenoid attachment is probably still attached, so it's a mid-substance tear. Then we see the bone edema up here straight superiorly, and then a lot of extravasation of fluid down into the axillary space. So you can see where the axillary vessels and nerve uh, could be at risk in an injury like this. Another example, a Hegel lesion, a tear. Of a, this is probably at a tear right here. It's not quite an avulsion off of the bone, uh, but we can see a tear, a lot of thickening of that inferior capsule, showing a chronic injury, a rotator cuff tear, and then a superior Hill Sachs lesion in this patient who had another uh, uh, inf uh, re recurrent inferior dislocations. Okay, normal or abnormal, Robert? Uh, this is, again, grossly abnormal. There's a lot of edema in that humeral head. It looks like it's inferiorly displaced. So, so it looks like these occur all the time here because we're seeing a bunch of them in a row, but these are pretty rare lesions. But this is what happens. So you can see why you get the inferior labral tear. You can see why you could get a rotator cuff tear in this, and you can also see why those inferior glenohumeral ligaments would be torn and are displaced because they can't stretch that far without mechanical failure. Here we can see a little bit of supraspinatus tendon coming all the way over here, but that tendon is not a happy tendon. Yeah. So There's an axillary nerve plus. Yeah, right. So why is there anything wrong with this patient upstairs, like in their neck? Uh, I don't know. This this is from France, so I, I don't have any other information. So why don't we stop here and we'll pick up continuing talking about uh, anterior dislocations and move on uh, tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. See you mañana. See you mañana, John. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yeah.